Thank you all for coming and welcome to Something to Talk About, which we do here at the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We are sponsored by Fieldstone Memory Care of Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers innovative and compassionate care and they are accepting residents to tour their beautifully appointed apartments on Rolling Bay today. Call Fieldstone at 360-271-2530. They'd like to show you around. They've done some great work up there at that uh, Rolling Bay facility. It's really, really pretty. Today we are going to be joined by, and are in fact already joined by Bob Hasslinger, who is known to uh, a lot of folks on Facebook due to his uh, stunning photos of uh, mostly birds, but also plants and other things from his backyard. And Bob, I'm looking forward to hearing about where those photos came from, some tips on how you have had fun framing the beauty outside your window and how we might benefit from your knowledge just a little bit. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to now share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's let's start here with with uh, with this. Um, I'm going to show you um, some pictures uh, of uh, uh, the birds that I started photographing in my uh, backyard. Um, I'm going to talk about how I started and how I progressed along in learning how to do that. Um, I'm going to take a brief moment to tell you what my background in photography is. Um, then I'm going to go back and show you some more birds, some in my backyard, and then I'm going to progress along to birds when I started going to other parts of Bainbridge Island, and, uh, including some of the parks, and uh, especially Port Blakely Harbor Park and uh, Shell Chell estuary, uh, taking uh, water birds and ducks. Uh, and then I'm going to end up the, the uh, program um, talking about digital photography in general and cell phone photography in particular, and how you can uh, make your cell phone photographs uh, actually better than you think that you can make them, that there's things that you can do um, with those photographs to make them uh, look better. Uh, both on your phone and if you share them with other people. So without much more introduction than that, let's get on. Um, this is a northern flicker, a male flicker. This is one of my early photographs. Um, I started taking um, uh, pictures of birds um, soon after I got uh, a new um, a full frame digital camera in June. Um, when I started uh, taking photographs, um, I only had um, the full frame digital camera and a um, sort of standard zoom lens, uh, 24 to 70 millimeter. This was the first photograph I took of a bird. It's a downy woodpecker, um, a female. And I realized I wasn't going to be able to take pictures of birds like I wanted with the equipment that I had. Um, so I proceeded to, um, to buy a zoom lens, a much longer zoom lens, and that allowed me to get pictures more like this. Um, I started off uh, taking photographs in the, our orchard. Um, uh, we have an apple orchard that's surrounded by a deer fence so that deer don't get it. So there was lots of um, uh, the plastic deer fence wire. Um, that was showing up in pretty much every photograph. Um, these birds were still, um, I thought, were quite fascinating, and I thought I was getting uh, really nice photographs. Um, the more common photo, uh, birds were the, the chickadees and the towhees and the, the juncos, um, but also I found that there was some um, birds that were migratory and uh, uh, was startled to see them and was really happy to get pictures of them. Um, this is a western tanager that showed up one day uh, and this is the female western tanager. The, the brightly colored one is the male as uh, usual except in a few uh, birds. Uh, the more drab bird is the female western tanager. Um, so there I was taking pictures of birds at feeders and birds on the fences and posting these on Facebook. And my friend um, Joel Sackett suggested to me that he would rather see birds that were not 
um, all entangled with uh, fences and feeders, that birds were available in um, other places uh, and that I could get them there. And I took his uh, suggestions to heart. I also decided that I was going to try and get pictures of uh, birds that were actually uh, telling stories um, like this black capped chickadee that was unhappy with the song sparrow that was hogging the, the feeder. Um, so I moved along and started taking pictures of um, the, the birds. Here's a, another song sparrow picture on a, um, a statue that's on a bird bath. Uh, and getting pictures of birds in flight and birds, um, uh, this is a female black-headed grosbeak, uh, in other um, situations that were not uh, feeder and fence locations. Um, Here's a, a towhee doing the towhee hop. The towhee hop is, uh, is a, a right common thing that towhees love to do. They hop around from place to place. Um, here's a white crowned sparrow in the water feature that we have with a water um, waterfall. Uh, loves to take a bath there. Lots of the birds love to take baths um, in those locations. Um, Here's a northern flicker doing a flicker hop. Uh, the flickers hop around from place to place too. Um, the flickers also have a very interesting way of flying. Uh, they aren't the only bird that does it, but they do it more commonly than many, is when they take off from a high perch, they don't always flap or glide with their wings out. They will tuck their wings and um, like a bullet um, aim towards something and then um, put their wings out when uh, they get up to a certain speed and use the lift from the, from the speed and the wings um, to rise up a little bit and then flap a little bit and then go back into um, this uh, wings touch uh, phase uh, or form. Um, and that gives them that, um, um, very characteristic uh, northern flicker bouncing flight pattern. Um, so while I was taking pictures of these birds that were uh, now no longer just in the orchard, um, I also started getting fascinated with um, hummingbirds. Um, we put out, has put out hummingbird feeders for years. Um, we've put out feeders for all the birds for years. My spouse and I are birders and have been for over 40 years, um, as long as we've been married. Um, but this is the first time I was able to actually uh, take the pictures that I wanted of birds. Um, that's a Rufus. This is an Anna's. This is an Anna's. Um, that doesn't have um, its red gorget because it's not um, uh, threatened in any way. The red gorget is the throat. Uh, in, um, as an Anna's gets uh, uh, in territorial fights, um, that red, that gorget will flame up to being red. Um, the um, Rufus um, are the reddish brown ones. Um, the Rufus come and they're not year round. Uh, the Annas will stay, we have uh, resident rent Annas that stay year round. Uh, the Rufus come and stay and we've pretty much timed them. The Rufus stay as long as the Crocosmia stay blooming. Uh, that's their favorite food. Um, uh, here's an Annas uh, feeding on Crocosmia. Um, they also like other uh, flowers. I, my spouse is a gardener, so we provide lots of uh, um, uh, flowers and other bushes for, for birds. Uh, this is a purple salvia, uh, and this is another rufous hummingbird. Um, the next slide is a picture of an Anna's hummingbird in the winter. Um, in the winter, um, our resident rufous hummingbirds um, uh, puff themselves up. Uh, the fluffing puts a lot of air between their feathers and their bodies and it keeps them warm. Uh, and you can see the slight edging of the red gorget um, on this, this uh, Anna's. Um, if he felt threatened, that whole dark area underneath his beak would turn red. Uh, and that's a warning to other hummingbirds that he's not very happy with them. This is the kind of thing that happens when hummingbirds decide that they're going to um, 
uh, face off uh, with each other. Uh, and um, uh, the Rufus was trying to convince the Annas to go away from its, uh, uh, where it was, which was about to land on a feeder. This is when it gets a little bit more um, uh, intense between them. Um, the Anna's hummingbird decided it wasn't going to put up with uh, uh, the impertinence of the Rufus. Uh, and being a bigger hummingbird, um, it took on the challenge and managed to tell the Rufus to go away. So that's a little beginning into um, my uh, bird photography in my backyard. Um, I started off not really knowing what I was doing with bird photography. Um, I hadn't done it before. I was getting to know the equipment. I was getting to know the camera. Um, I was getting to know where the birds were, um, how to, to find the birds. Um, I found that what I needed to do was to um, uh, have three particular things. Uh, anticipation was an extremely important. Patience was extremely important, and practice was extremely important. Um, so as I moved along through the process, I got better. But this isn't my first rodeo with photographs. Um, I was a professional photographer from the time I was in high school, um, senior in high school, uh, through my mid-30s. In 1974, I started taking landscape photographs, uh, large format landscape photographs. This is in Austin, Texas, where I lived at the time. Um, I was doing black and white landscape photographs. Um, a couple of years later, I was doing color landscape photographs. This is the same dam. It's the Tom Miller Dam. Um, I was not only doing uh, landscape photographs of a realist nature, uh, but I was adding in some um, uh, abstract and um, uh, uh, pictures that, that included a combination of realism and uh, abstraction, and sometimes just pure abstraction. Um, I traveled throughout the entire Southwest from Texas to California and from New Mexico to Wyoming, uh, taking photographs for clients. And when I was out taking photographs of clients, I also took landscape photographs. This is from the Lake Tahoe area. Uh, this is from Northern New Mexico, where I had a job taking photographs um, of uh, um, uh, logging sites in New Mexico. Um, this was a picture from the lower canyons of the Rio Grande in the Big Bend area. Um, uh, that's the Rio Grande. Um, this is a photograph of um, uh, uh, a uh, rock feature in the Rio Grande. Um, this is a picture of a waterfall in um, Bandelier National Monument. And finally, this is a photograph of Bryce Canyon. Um, this is a very common photograph from that area, but this was the 1980s and um, we didn't have digital cameras where everybody that goes to Bryce Canyon takes the same photograph and puts it on pin interest uh, or on Facebook. Um, back then, uh, the way you got to see these photographs is someone like uh, myself would take the photograph and then offer them in a gallery um, or uh, in, uh, people would buy it for a collection. I sold photographs to corporate and individual collections, uh, made my own prints, and um, I did quite a bit of this. Um, bird photography was not something I could do because the equipment back then didn't allow you to shoot at eight thousandth of a second, and nor did I have the telephoto lenses that would allow me to take the photographs of the birds. I really stopped taking photographs in the mid 80s um, when I changed professions. I became a, a technology consultant and uh, quit the, the work of um, photography um, and never really picked up photography as a, even a hobby until I started taking pictures of my backyard um, with an iPhone. Uh, this is a phone, an iPhone 7 photograph. Um, I uh, spent uh, quite a bit of time over the years taking pictures of that cherry tree, which is the red tree in our backyard uh, through multiple seasons. Um, and my backyard became a place where I took photographs of uh, flowers and um, trees and sunsets and sunrises. This is a sunrise. Um, and I'm going to come back to this photograph at the end of the presentation to show you how 
um, you can uh, take uh, the photographs that you take with your um, uh, cell phone, whatever phone it is, uh, Android or iPhone, uh, and make them look better than you think that you can make them look. Let's go back to birds. Um, notice the poplar trees there. That's a favorite place for a red-tailed hawk to sit. We've had red-tailed hawks sit uh, in our valley. We live uh, in a valley um, uh, that's open and the red-tails love to hunt, hunt there. Uh, in the 34 years that we've lived here, we've always had one red-tailed hawk or another uh, hunt in our valley um, through the spring, summer, and fall months. Um, uh, this one was sitting waiting and uh, maybe it saw something and it decided to go after it, uh, but it took off and I uh, took a photograph of it. This is the red tail in the top of a Sitka spruce. I really like hawks. Here's the reason why red tail hawks are called red tail hawks. They have red tails. Here's another picture of the red-tailed hawk. This next picture is a red-tailed hawk being mobbed by a cooper's hawk. Mobbing is a behavior where um, usually one raptor, whether it's a, a red tail or a, a larger bird like an eagle, uh, comes into the area of a smaller bird like a cooper's hawk or crows or uh, even robins. Uh, and they will fly up and they will harass the bigger um, uh, bird uh, to try and move it out of their area. Um, I was very fortunate to catch this photograph. Um, seeing it is a, is a difficult thing because it doesn't happen all that often. Taking photographs of it is even more difficult. This is a photograph of two juvenile red-tailed hawks. There was actually four juvenile red-tailed hawks together in the sky that day. I could only get two of them in my frame at one time. Red-tailed hawks are usually um, solitary hunters, uh, except uh, towards the end of their first year, um, a family of red-tailed hawks, uh, the youngsters will fly around together in their territory. Um, often they're not particularly hunting, they're just getting to know their territory. They may split off then and hunt individually, um, but this was uh, a day when four of the red tails were in the sky at once. Once again, not a common thing. Not only do we have red tails in the, in the valley we have, but we have osprey. Uh, osprey um, have a nest up at the, the uh, uh, water tower in the Grand Forest. Uh, usually the osprey are up so high that I can't take photographs of them. I think this one had pity on me and decided to fly low enough for me to take a photograph of it. Um, I have other pictures of osprey um, flying, uh, but not in my backyard. All of the photographs you've seen so far are pictures that I took in my backyard. Um, even the next one, which is a juvenile great blue heron. This great blue heron decided it wanted to eat the goldfish and the koi in our um, uh, pond, our water feature pond. Uh, we have motion activated sprinklers and a little bit of netting to discourage that. My spouse and I were both out there at the same time that this bird came by and we convinced it to move on to another location. Fortunately, um, that thing of being prepared and being patient allowed me to um, take a picture of that bird as it flew off. Um, I really like taking pictures of flying birds. You've seen some so far. Here's a northern flicker in flight. It's uh, about to land on a, um, a feeder. Um, uh, that tail down is a, is a way of stopping its motion as it goes forward. Um, here's a blue jay coming in, a, a stellar's jay, excuse me, not a blue jay, a stellar's jay coming in for a landing on a feeder post. Um, somebody said, boy, you were lucky. And I went back to the, to the, uh, my three points, which is anticipation, um, uh, to start off with patience. Uh, and practice. Um, this wasn't the first time I tried to take a picture of uh, a bird landing um, here with the wings spread. Um, and I just happened to be ready because I saw the blue jay coming in from a tree. Um, I knew what it was going to do. Uh, I took several shots, rapid shots in sequence and got the picture that I wanted of this blue jay, uh, a stellar's jay coming in for a landing. 
Um, I really like the color of the Stellar's Jays. Um, I'm very fond of, the, they're very noisy and they're obnoxious and they chase away other birds, um, but there's something uh, really um, interesting about them with their mohawk hairdos and uh, their beautiful blue feathers. Uh, this is the st same Stellar's Jay sitting on the um, uh, bird bath uh, sculpture again. So <clears throat> one of the most common things that you'll see in your backyard, as in my backyard, is something that um, uh, birders call LBBs, which is little brown birds. Uh, little brown birds are the most common birds. Uh, here's a white crown sparrow in uh, blackberries. Um, uh, it's, uh, if you don't see its head, it's difficult to tell that it's a white crowned sparrow and the juveniles and um, out of breeding, the, the white stripe on its head is not very ob obvious. Uh, and so it just looks like a little brown bird. Here's a golden crown sparrow. This is a, a juvenile golden crown sparrow and the golden crown isn't very um, obvious. Um, you'll see that it is obvious in a minute, but this one is a savanna sparrow. Now, you look at this one and go, savanna sparrow, gold on its, its brow, that must be a golden crown sparrow. Well, the golden crown sparrow has the gold on top of its head, not on the side of its head. Uh, so once again, it's having to take a very careful look um, at these little brown birds uh, to figure out what exactly they are. Uh, taking a photograph and looking at the photograph later helps. Um, I don't always know exactly what I've taken a photograph when I take it, but I do know what it is once I um, take the photograph and I process it and take a look at it and I can figure out, oh yes, that was a golden crown sparrow. Um, not quite brown, but classified in with the LBBs are um, chickadees. Um, this is a black cap chickadee uh, eating some lilac seeds. Here's a chestnut back chickadee um, on apple tree shoots uh, in the winter. And this is one of the most common um, LBBs, which is the dark eyed junco, which is ubiquitous. Uh, the dark eyed juncos and the song sparrows are perhaps the most common birds on Bainbridge Island. One of the most fun little birds um, that we have uh, is the bush tit. Now the bush tit uh, is uh, really small. It's one of the smallest birds uh, uh, except for the hummingbirds. This is a female. It has a yellow eye. It has the yellow ring in its eye. They usually come in flocks uh, and they'll fly in and chitter around and do whatever they're going to do to to get something to eat and then fly off. Uh, and it's uh, often difficult to take pictures of them because they don't stop moving. They're constantly in motion. This is a male uh, bush tit. Uh, it doesn't have the yellow ring on its eye. Another common bird um, uh, that's in the LBB um, form uh, are pine siskins. Now, pine siskins are another, like the bush tits, they come in flocks. Um, they're often in flocks. Um, one of the unfortunate things about pine siskins is they're very susceptible to salmonella. Um, if you have seed feeders out, um, uh, you have to be very careful uh, because you can get sick birds uh, and those birds uh, pass on the illness to other birds uh, through their bird poop. Um, that's uh, either in the seed pans or below the seeds and you have to take your seed feeders up and clean them and wait until the pine siskins move on before you put um, seed back out again. Um, but they're fun little birds. Um, they're once again very busy birds uh, and come in flocks. Uh, one of my favorite birds is the red-breasted nuthatch. Uh, this bird will um, uh, never seems to be sitting upright. It's always either uh, vertical or it feeds on the, the feeders upside down. Um, quite a cute little bird. The Washington State bird is the goldfinch. Here's a daddy goldfinch feeding uh, an immature goldfinch. Um, this is uh, something that happens um, 
uh, quite often in the summer months. Um, the daddies are, are uh, very much responsible for the uh, raising of the brood. Um, this is another uh, bird that we get that passes through um, our area. It doesn't stay year round. It's a cedar waxwing. If you notice down at the bottom, there are yellow tips to um, its uh, feathers and its tail. Um, that's a, a real giveaway of, of the cedar waxwing along with the black band across its eye. This is the largest woodpecker that we have. This is a pileated woodpecker. Um, this is a, a male uh, pileated. It's probably not a, a very um, old pileated. It doesn't have a really big red cockade. Um, uh, uh, you can see its tongue. It, it, it will drill holes in, in uh, trees, especially rotted trees, and it'll drill perfectly round holes um, looking for um, whatever it wants to eat. Uh, and uses that marvelous tongue to, to get to uh, the bugs and the grubs and um, uh, the other insects that are uh, in the trees. We go from the largest woodpecker that we have in this area to the smallest. This is a downy woodpecker. Um, once again, a male because it has the red on the back of its head. The female doesn't have the red. Once again, keeping with the idea that um, in the bird world, for the most part, um, male birds are the colorful ones and the females are the drab, but we'll show you a little bit different, um, something different uh, in a little bit. Uh, this is uh, one of the more skittish birds that we have around here. It's not uncommon, but it doesn't stick around long. Um, if uh, you go out and about, um, it's a morning dove. Um, they are food. Um, they are very skittish because the hawks uh, really like them. This is a very common bird around here. Um, this is uh, uh, a American robin um, taking, um, uh, eating a hawthorn berry um, uh, in the hawthorn tree. Um, this is the spotted toey also in the hawthorn tree. Um, notice the, that uh, really noticeable orange eye uh, of the spotted toey. Another bird that's of the, about the same size as the robins and the spotted toey is the varied thrush. The varied thrush usually comes in the fall and winter. Uh, they come down for the higher elevations and uh, we leave uh, our um, leaf um, duff uh, in our gardens. We don't uh, blow it out or, or rake it up because the thrush and other birds really like the, the insects uh, and worms that um, hide in this and the thrush like this, the toey will uh, hop around in it and um, uh, root through the, the leaves uh, to find um, uh, food. Um, and um, they do that in the fall and in the winter. Um, this is a male, it's got a very dark band under the orange under its chin. This is a female uh, standing on one foot it has a gray band under its chin. It's all puffed up because that white stuff that's on the limb in front of it is snow and it's very cold. And so it's keeping its foot up to keep it warm and it's all puffed up to stay warm. Um, so uh, I'm gonna go back to a picture of a dark eyed junco just because I like this picture. And I thought I'd uh, use this as a transition picture to talking about how do I get birds in my backyard for me to take photographs of? Well, we use bird feeders. This is a northern flicker and a junco on a suet cake feeder. The suet cake that we use is hot pepper suet. Um, it's got um, uh, chili peppers in it. The um, birds are not susceptible to the heat from the papasan and the and the, the chili peppers, um, the squirrels and the rats and the um, mice uh, are uh, such as we are and they don't like it. And so we don't have a problem with rodents or squirrels uh, because they don't like the, um, the hot pepper uh, suet. 
And the bag there is a Nair um, sock feeder. A Nair is a form of thistle. Uh, it's been treated so that it doesn't germinate and we don't have uh, thistles growing up underneath that feeder. Um, you'll see in a minute what kind of birds like uh, the, the Nair feeder. This is a Junko on a squirrel buster feeder. Uh, we use the squirrel buster and one other feeder uh, to give the um, smaller birds a chance at, at eating uh, because the bigger birds, um, the flicker and the Stellar's jay will hog the, um, the larger feeder, the larger suet feeder, and the smaller birds get chased away. Uh, so this is a feeder that the little birds can eat at. If a bigger bird lands on this feeder or a squirrel lands on this feeder, um, that um, cage uh, that's above the bird will slide down. It's gravity um, activated and it will close off the, the feeder. We also have a double cage feeder. This is a red-winged blackbird being very frustrated because it can't get to the suet that's in there because it's too big. Um, so the red-winged blackbird came up and took a look at it and um, expressed disgust and flew away. But the dark-eyed junco, as you can see, can get inside the outer cage and get to the suet that's inside the inside um, cage. Here are pine siskins. They and the goldfinches really like the um, uh, thistle, uh, the Nyer thistle seed that's in the thistle sock. Um, uh, they came as a flock, and as you can see, they're flocking all over it. The juncos also like um, the, uh, the Nyer seed, and so we will have them as well on those. I don't often take pictures of the birds on the feeders. It attracts them. Um, they end up on the, the trees and in the bushes and, and other places around uh, the property. And this just means that we have them. Now, if we didn't feed them, we'd still have birds because we plant a lot of um, uh, shrubs uh, and flowers that birds like. Uh, but this uh, congregates them. Now, if we didn't feed them, they wouldn't starve because there's lots of natural food around. Um, those feeders are actually for my enjoyment, my enjoyment, my spouse's enjoyment, uh, not so much for the necessity of feeding the birds. When you have bird feeders, you also have um, uh, the hawks uh, that prey on the, the birds uh, that come to the feeders. This is a juvenile Cooper's hawk. Um, he wasn't very smart. Um, he came in and um, of course scared all the birds away, so he was very frustrated. Um, that's a frustrated Cooper's hawk look. Uh, this was during our recent snow. Um, this is the, the similar, uh, a similar uh, juvenile Cooper's hawk uh, who came in and landed below the, the feeders and scared everybody off and once, away, once again was very frustrated. Um, Cooper's hawks tend to, to come in and land and wait uh, and then grab a bird. Um, sharp shin hawks are uh, uh, hide, they're, much, they're quite a bit smaller and they come out like a, a rifle shot and will catch birds on the wing. The Cooper's hawk usually catch them on the ground or on the feeder. I'm now going to go to um, uh, a next set of photos that are not from my backyard. Um, after I had been taking photographs in my backyard of birds, I decided that I wanted to branch out and look at birds in other locations. So I started going to um, places like the Shell Chell um, Estuary, the Port Blakely Harbor Park, um, uh, uh, Bay Bainbridge Park, uh, Fort Ward Park, uh, and other places where um, there were water birds and started taking pictures of water birds. This is a great blue heron. This heron was sitting in the water near the shore. I patiently wa watched him and when he started, when he took off, I noticed that he had tangled his feet in seaweed. Um, he went out and landed on a personal watercraft that was moored um, off the shore of Pleasant Beach 
and proceeded to clean the, the seaweed off his feet. Uh, but I got this um, as he was flying away. Here's another great blue heron in bird circles. They're called GBH, uh, great blue heron. Um, I thought this was a nice photograph of a heron in flight. Now this is uh, a belted kingfisher. This is a female belted kingfisher. The male does not have the reddish brown uh, coloration. This is one of the few birds where the um, female is actually more colorful than the male. There's a little white dot in front of uh, this bird's eye. Uh, my understanding from my reading is that the bird uses that as an assist when it's diving into the water um, to help with the refraction of the water uh, so it can keep focused on the fish that it's trying to catch. Um, I, I have no idea how that works. I'm just telling you what I read, but that's why there's a little white dot before in front of uh, the bird's eye. This is that same uh, belted kingfisher in flight. Once again, I try if I can to get birds in flight. Um, there's a, a, a quite a bit of patience and practice required for doing that. Um, this is a picture of a belted kingfisher with a great blue heron in the path in the back, um, uh, out of focus. Um, I kind of like that picture. Now, one of the things that, that you might have noticed is that I've changed in terms of my um, abilities uh, to take pictures of birds uh, from the early ones where I was struggling to understand the equipment and um, how it is that you take pictures of birds to getting to a point where I'm now taking pictures that have not only stories to them, uh, but are quite dramatic pictures. They're actually really nice photographs and not just pictures of birds. Um, this is a horned grebe in winter plumage. I really was struck by the reddish eyes. Um, uh, uh, it, it's really true that that's the color of their eyes. Um, uh, they are noted for that. This is the horned grebe. Um, the, the difference between this picture and this picture has to do with um, uh, luminance. Luminance is the, um, the range of values between dark and light. Um, a low luminance um, uh, photograph has a, a smaller range of, uh, of values between dark and light. Um, the higher luminance uh, photographs have uh, a, a greater range between dark and light. So for instance, if you notice this one, the, the range of, of uh, values between the darkest part and the brightest part uh, is much broader than on this one. We'll get back to that again in a minute. This is another fairly low luminance um, uh, a picture of a spotted sandpiper at the Port Blakely Harbor Park. Um, there's not a whole lot of, uh, it's a fairly gray day, and there's not a whole lot of, of change between the dark and the light in this picture. But once again, I think it's a really nice picture. Um, I'm just going to run through a few more pictures of, of birds, some ducks to start with now. Uh, this is Shell Chell um, Estuary, an American Widgeon. This is um, uh, mostly female uh, American widgeons, except the one that's the second from the bottom, which is a male that has the green eye stripe. Here is the American widgeon with the green eye stripe and his reflection. Mallards are uh, ubiquitous. They're throughout the entire North America. Um, They're often, uh, uh, ignored or uh, denigrated because they are so ubiquitous and so common, uh, but I don't think that that makes them any less beautiful. Especially that male mallard's iridescent green head. This is a, a pair from the Port Blakely Harbor Park. One of people's favorite um, ducks is the bufflehead. The bufflehead is a cute little bird. Um, it's a small duck. Um, it has uh, that multicolored uh, rainbow head um, on the male. 
Um, and it spends a, a lot of its time diving um, for, uh, for its, its food. Um, and it spends some amount of time just showing off. Um, it, it is a, 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 that's one of the cute things about this bird. Um, it, it likes to, to show off for um, other buffle heads. And uh, uh, this next picture is a one that was one that I was really pleased to catch. It's a buffle head um, making a run um, to take off. Uh, they need to get a certain amount of speed up before they're gonna get up in the air. Uh, and uh, this bird was nice enough to do it in such a way that I could take a picture of um, uh, its attempt to go into flight. Uh, so more birds, more water birds. Here are some common mergansers. These are four females um, flying at the Port Blakely Harbor Park. Um, this is a female common merganser in a hurry. Um, I'm not quite sure where she's going so fast, but she decided she needed to go somewhere pretty quick. This is her in a little bit more sedate um, uh, motion, um, her and her reflection. Um, there are multiple kinds of mergansers in the area. Um, here's a hooded merganser and a male hooded merganser and a female hooded merganser drying her wings. Uh, when we, um, um, this is from uh, Faye Bainbridge Park. It's a double crested cormorant, very common around here. While we're, uh, I'm taking pictures of the water birds, um, there's always other birds um, hanging around um, that are not water birds, American crows, this is a yellow rumped warbler that was down at Shell Chelb. This is the ubiquitous song sparrow um, on rose hips down at um, uh, uh, near the Shell Chelb. Down there along Point White Drive, there's a set of um, uh, bulrushes uh, where red winged blackbirds are in the summer and fall. And um, uh, uh, here's another bush tit um, that was uh, at uh, Port Blakely Harbor Park. And finally, in terms of the birds photographs, uh, is a photograph that um, seemed to be very popular or was very popular on Facebook. Um, I didn't really think at first that I would post it because I didn't know that it was all that would be all that popular, but it's a bald eagle and people seem to really like it. Uh, I think it because it has a painterly effect to it. Let me move on to um, talking to you about, uh, I have just a very few minutes left, uh, about uh, digital photography. Remember me talking about luminance? Uh, well, in luminance are, is the, is, uh, are the steps between dark and light. Uh, in, an Im in a location, in, in, in the real world, and in an image. So when you're looking at a scene, you have dark values, uh, like the trunk of the tree. You have light values, like the clouds in the upper right-hand corner. And you have a range of values between the dark and the light. The various steps between dark and light uh, can be doubling of light values. Um, the doubling of light values, you know, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, um, 32, 64, etc. cetera, on. Uh, those, are, those are steps. In this particular photographs, you probably have uh, perhaps as many as 11, 10 or 11 steps uh, of doubling of light between dark and light. Um, in some of those ones that I said were low luminance, you may only have five or six steps between dark and light. Let me talk for a moment about algorithm. Algorithm is nothing more than um, a program that a human um, uh, programmed uh, into an electronic device, a digital device, to make decisions based on the rules that the human made up. Um, it's not anything fancy, it's just a set of rules. 
your sensor in your camera, whether it be a, a cell phone or whether it be a, a expensive um, mirrorless camera, um, can uh, uh, can sense all of the values in a scene from very dark to very light. And as long as you don't blow out the highlights, all of that information is in is captured by the sensor. The algorithm decides what you can see on your screen because your screen cannot display the entire range of, um, of values, luminance values from dark to light uh, on the screen at the same time if it's showing it in a linear fashion uh, or according to the algorithm that was programmed in it. Uh, most of the algorithms or decisions made by your, um, your instrument, your cell phone or your camera, um, give you um, an average, uh, give you the most common um, uh, presentation of values from dark to light. Uh, so this is what uh, the algorithm decided that um, I should see from that particular photograph when I took it with my, um, my cell phone, which was an iPhone 7. I can make changes to that by using the edit function of the cell phone. Up in the upper right hand corner, it says edit. I click on edit. I get to the edit function. And you can see already that I've used the edit function to raise the shadow values. Now the shadow values are the lowest values the lowest luminance values in a, in a picture. I've raised them up so that you notice that I can see more of the, the lower values and get more color there, but I haven't affected the highlight values. The, the clouds are still um, retain um, their um, detail and are not getting blown out. The next is brilliance. Now, brilliance affects the mid-tones, uh, um, the areas between the shadow and the highlights. Uh, it does not affect the shadows or the highlights. As a matter of fact, it may actually depress the shadows and the highlights a little bit as it opens up the mid-tones. Uh, you notice on this one, uh, where before the fog is, is not very uh, prominent, when we adjust the brilliance, the fog comes out a little bit better. The next is brightness. Brightness affects the overall value um, of the, uh, the image. Um, I really didn't need to use the brightness so much in this uh, image, um, but I did it so that I could show that to you. The next is if you're going to manipulate the brightness, you need to bring the, the highlights back down. So here are the highlights. The highlights are being brought back down. So they're uh, back where they were uh, before we um, um, added the brightness. And then uh, uh, one of the uh, last two things, three things we, we do is I add, uh, I go to black point and black point takes the darkest areas of the, um, of the image and drops those, uh, uh, that luminance down once again to a, a really dark um, value, which allows you to have a very dark point and a very light point in, a, in a, the scene, which is pleasing to the eye to be able to have a full range of values. Now you can do a couple of more things that are um, uh, not uh, often thought of as, uh, as things that, that uh, people wanna do, but here's a little bit of extra saturation. If you notice the colors just pop up a little bit, the greens and the reds um, uh, are uh, a little bit uh, better and um, come out a little bit. Uh, that's a personal preference. And finally, sharpness, <coughs> where, you can sharpen up the image so that um, so that things look a little bit more crisp in terms of imaging, and then there you have the finished image. Now, some people say, "Well, that's like Photoshop." Well, no, I disagree. It's not like Photoshop at all. 
what we've done is we've done made our own choices instead of letting the phone make the choices instead of the programmer who programmed the algorithm making choices as to what um, that image is going to be displayed as we went in and took the information that the sensor had recorded and made the choices of how that was displayed on our on our um, device. Um, that is uh, our choices instead of an automatic choice made by um, a programmer. Here's another image. Here's another image where I made some choices. And that's pretty much my show. Thank you very much. Very interesting and enlightening. Uh, does anyone have any comments or questions about uh, the range of things that Bob talked to us about? Pat? Well, thank you. <laughs> this was absolutely amazing. You are a wonderful teacher. Your images are amazing. Um, I'd like to see this program shown to other people. This is just wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Well, thank you, Pat. I'll all of us should share it. <laughs> this this <laughs> yeah. is this is really terrific and beautifully presented. Well, thank you, Paul. You're a, a wonderful photographer. I appreciate your photography. I see a, a lot of it, uh, and I, I really take that as a high compliment because you're an excellent photographer. Oh, thank you. I want to know what you think of Apple's version of RAW. Uh, Apple's version of RAW in in what? Um, well, in the, the latest. Um, couple of years their cameras have a raw but it's you know everybody has their own raw and uh sometimes for me it, it works pretty well and others i can't get the look that i like out of it are you talking in, in their in their uh, iphones and ipads the iphones yes yes yeah. well i'm still using an iphone 7 so i don't <laughs> I, I don't have access to the most recent apple raw um, i've moved on to to canon and i use the raw photos so let me explain what raw is um, thank you raw is the the image that you get when you get all of the information that the sensor presents um, so the sensor takes a wide range uh, and it's not compressed and it gives you the very lowest values and the very highest values all in one image. When you try and show them on a screen, like I expressed earlier, the screen has a limited range, whatever screen that you have. It's sort of like a print. A print is reflected light. It only can show the, the light that's reflected um, off the whites and off the darks uh, on the print, and that has a limited range to it. Well, the same thing is true with your with your um, your screen, whether it's your phone screen uh, or your computer screen, it's got more range than a print does because it's transmitted light. Transmitted light means that there's a light source behind the screen and the brights are brighter and the darks aren't fully black, but they're pretty good if you've got a good screen. But still that transmitted light that you've got from a screen is less than what can be captured by a sensor using the raw mode. So the raw mode in a, in a, uh, a Canon mirrorless like mine has an extreme range and we get to make lots of choices between, between uh, in, in that range to what we're going to present. And what Paul is talking about is Apple has a raw mode um, that lets us make choices in that way as well. Am I, am I saying that right, Paul? Yes, uh, Apple is notorious for wanting to do all your thinking for you. So it was very nice to have a raw introduced. Um, let's, uh, Lynn, did you have a comment or question? No. No. Okay, I, I just saw <laughs> you had taken your That's... your your uh, mute off, and Sheila. No, oh, it's fine. Okay, wanted to make sure everybody had a chance um, to comment. Yeah, Bob, this is uh, both a wonderful uh, images. I just am uh, so what uh, enraptured by the kind of um, personalities that the birds exhibit when you are able to get so uh, so close. And of course, the detail of their, um, of, of their plumage and everything is delightful with your zoom lens and patience and, uh, and setting. Well, thank you, thank you. If, if you want, I'm gonna show you just one little thing, if you don't mind. 
Yeah. Okay, so let's look at this picture of this uh, um, great blue heron, this GBH. Um, this is the, the raw image um, as it came out of the camera. You can see it's fairly flat, uh, but I'm gonna show you um, uh, something here. This profile that I've got showing now is an RGB profile, which is the profile um, that is that of a um, computer screen. Your computer screen is red, green, blue. So this is the, the computer profile for that. Um, I can take this profile and I can um, make changes to it. So I darken parts of it. Um, uh, I can change the brightness level. You know, we talked about that. But when I'm doing this, uh, I'm doing it based on red, green, blue. Now, if I'm going to print this, I can look in this program and I can see what it's gonna look like on matte paper. Do you see what, what all of a sudden, even though I had those changes made, if I print this on matte paper, it's going to be a lot flatter. But if I'm going to print it on glossy paper, you notice it comes back and it shows the, the, those changes that I made. So that's, that's one of the things that, that a photographer who's going to um, uh, present his work or her work um, on a computer screen or in printing materials, whether it be glossy paper or matte paper, has to be aware of that that luminance value is going to change depending on how the, that um, that that uh, image is going to be viewed. Now, I don't know the value of any of your screens. Your screens may, may have a different that set of luminance values than mine. So I can only guess and say, I'm going to do the best I can by using the standard RGB view, which is this one, and say, I hope that your screen matches that. Thank you very much, Bob. We're out of time, but I yep. really appreciate this. Yep. And I look forward to you coming back again uh, sometime if, uh, yeah. if interested. I'm also going to let you know, put you in touch with the Bainbridge Island Photo Club because they might like to have you come visit as well sometime. Absolutely. Very good. And, oh, and I'm glad, so glad I was able to do that last little bit. Um, that was, I think, important to talk about how what people were seeing may not have been what I was showing.